It's almost and I'm not thing. talking about Spirit of Eden, I'm talking about Colour Show. They made a record with no single name, <laughs> according to EMI. It's almost like the perfect convergence of uh, confidence and almost and resentment, you know, of... Because um, Mark, obviously, uh, as you've detailed in the book, he took those comparisons very heavily, didn't he? And, and, you know, you can almost see in the trajectory leading up to this period, the spring coiling creatively. Um, it's interesting that he, you know, was operating in, you know, all the bands that you've mentioned from Japan to Duran Duran um, are very kind of synthesizer led yes. in, in, in many ways. And, and uh, I was interested to read um, in the book something that, that I have to say did cut me fairly deeply um, personally. On you, you, the, love, you love a synthesizer, I, don't I you? I love a, a bleep every now mm. and again. Um, the mark was a a vehement anti-synthesis. Um, he, you've quoted him as saying, I absolutely hate synthesizers, he told Electronics and Music Maker. If they didn't exist, I'd be delighted. A month later, he told another magazine, we have to use synthesizers for touring, but aside from that, I absolutely hate the things. And he uh, felt that they were simply budget replacements for real instruments, right? And that fits perfectly um, into his kind of the purism that I'm sure would have led him to love, you know, John Coltrane, as you've mentioned, um, and a lot of, the, you know, the ECM side of jazz. Um, but there was also, yeah, but at the same time, he was kind of having his cake and eating it. Right. A, a little bit, as, as I'm sure you know, you read the book, you know, and the, the, the colour of spring was built around the fair light. Right. That, that, that you, I'm sure, know all about. Tell me it was also much. phenomenally expensive. Yeah, and there were very few people that had a fair life, but I think it was Tim, I think Tim Priest Green owned one, and a lot of that album was, was based, was written around drum parts which were created on that fair life. And, and apparently, while they, were, uh, while they were mixing it, Mark was obsessively playing around and loving, you know, like a, like a Hornby train set, you know, tinkering <laughs> with the fair life. So, there's a little bit of, you know, um, uh, he set out his stall and, he's, and he's, he's telling us a line. But that's, and at the same time, yeah, sure, he definitely was using synthesizers because they didn't have the cash to get all of the um, coterie of session musicians who then came in on the, late, on the later albums. But at the same time, he, you know, he wanted to be successful. And in 1981, when the Talk Talk were first releasing records, that was what people wanted to hear, you know. And there was certainly Simon Brenner, who was the first keyboard player for Talk Talk. He was, you know, he was playing very OMD-ish, you know, orchestral moves in the dark um, type. Uh, squiggly wiggly sort of synth lines. He wasn't, he certainly wasn't playing, you know, um, vari you know vari variants of McCoy Tyner's sort of, you know, jazz improvisations, which... It's almost like it would be in his interest to broadcast that view in the sense, because he did know how to play the press a little bit, didn't he? There's a great bit where you're talking about um, in this somebody asking him about recording the track, it's getting late in the evening. Uh, which I very much think of as, the, as that's the transitional track. Absolutely, that was the B-side, I'm saying this is me not remembering the facts now, but that was the B-side of one of the singles from Colour of Spring. That's right, yeah. And he, and he, uh, and he was asked on what microphone, because it's very, these microphones, ambient mics, mm -hmm. far away from, and somebody said, so what microphone did you use to record that? And his response was, oh, it was a silver one with a blob on top. <laughs> and he knew just when to be oblique and when to be kind of sincere, and he, he played journalists quite frequently, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot, we probably haven't got time for it tonight, so buy the, buy the book, people. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he certainly, there's a real, it goes back to the respect that he got from the press in Europe. He really was treated, um, a lot of research went into um, uh, features that the German, uh, Dutch, particularly Dutch journalists and, and Italian journalists got um, pr prepared before interviews with him, which simply didn't happen with the enemy and Melody Maker and, and, and Record Mirror and, and indeed the international musician, I think it was. And so he just mainly ripped the piss in the UK and got the reputation. And also but at the same time he had this strange kind of ability to be, to be an absolute wind-up piss taker and then become terribly earnest 
almost in the, in, on the turn of a sixpence. And it would be quite hard to read, you know, what was earnest and what was piss take if, if you were unfamiliar with, with him as a person. Whereas in Europe, maybe with the language thing, I don't know, but he was generally pretty earnest throughout and much more open and much more truthful and much more interesting. You know, all of the interviews from, you know, Dutch uh, magazines like Or from the 80s, that's O-O-R, I think it means ear. Um, they're great, you know, they're really, re re they're really, really revelatory. You know, he talks about Tim Freeze Green. In the same month, he talks to them about Tim Freeze Green and says, oh, you know, Tim Freeze Green, he's been with us from, you know, from right from the, from the early days and we, we had this incredible connection when we song right. And, uh, and then he's asked the same question by, um, I, think it was, I think it was Sounds, uh, in the same months. You know, what, what's your relationship with Tim Freeze Green like? And he said, well, he's pretty much the most boring man I've ever met. And <laughs> just starts sort of just having, a, just having a laugh, you know, not really taking the question seriously. So, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it's a challenging, it, it's challenging to kind of dig and get why he was like that. So I think, uh, talking of Tim Freeze Green, mm. it's probably a good moment to get our next guest up. Um, mm. We're really lucky to have him with us. Uh, engineer of Spirit of Eden and longtime Talk Talk collaborator, Phil Brown. Good evening, Phil. Do you know what one of these is? you know how this works? Well, it's silver. <laughs> With a blob on top, right? Blob on top. Must be good. <laughs> so, you, uh, it's interesting just talking, Ben, about um, the way that Mark would flip between sincere and um, sort of performative, if you want a better word. Yes. Um, Phil, is, your, Phil has a, a wonderful book out as well, Are We Still Rolling? which um, details some really interesting vignettes throughout his career, particularly an interesting uh, anecdote about being called up last minute to record Pink Floyd live at Wembley. Could, is it all right with you if I read this little extract before we move on? I think it's worth. Um, this is uh, having, on your first day off for some time, being asked to go and record Pink Floyd um, at Wembley. And you went into your studio booker, Penny's office, and you write, I went down to the kitchen, filled a bucket with cold water, and carried it into Penny's office. She was sitting at her desk as usual, looking very smart in a cream skirt and white blouse with a silk scarf around her neck. Her hair was perfect. She glanced in my direction, and it was clear from her manner that she hadn't realized, she either hadn't realized she'd given me a problem, or she had forgotten all about it. Her assistant, Annie was also there, and both were getting ready to go out for lunch. I made a direct hit from head to toe, taking Penny completely by surprise. She sat there drenched with a stunned look on her face. I hope this inconveniences you the way that you have just inconvenienced me, I said, and left in my cab for Wembley. As far as I gather, that didn't happen in the Spirit of Eden sessions that we know of. Um, I was young then. <laughs> but the first time you met Mark, he didn't want to talk about music at all, did he? No, I was called uh, by Tim to go and meet Mark, and um, we met in a pub in Stanmore, and we talked about football, which I don't really follow, um, various dubious politicians, um, a lot of humour, he had a very kind of sarcastic wit. Um, talked about a bit, of, a bit about music, but not about what he planned to do and never asked me anything really about what I'd done. It was kind of a, a strange interview in a way. So we spent an hour and then um, I had to get back into town and he said, oh, can you give us a lift to a tube? So it's, you know, it's 4.30, it's rush hour and he, he's, I'm now a driver and, it, you know, and um, so then in a way the, the main interview happened because, you know, he asked me about my days at Olympic and and that was what got you the job on Spirit of Eden, and you stayed with Talk Talk for... Well, I was with Mark for 13 years, mm. so one of the longest survivors in fact. Yeah. 
And I, and the, I mean, you're in uh, in your book. You you go through some amazing um, some amazing anecdotes of various sessions from working with Bob Marley on I Shot the Sheriff <laughs> and Rolling Stones and Beggar's Banquet, um, Roxy Music. Where in that kind of um, you know, it's really it's a it's a sort of a litany of household names, really. Where, where does this uh, body of work fit in that kind of uh, CV for you personally? Well, um, I was about to leave the business in '86. Um, I hadn't worked for about six months. I was working on something at the time. I met Mark in the pub, but I hadn't worked really. I was working at in markets down in Rye and stuff like that. Um, I hated a lot of the 80s sounds, a lot of the 80s digital, early digital sounds. I, I wasn't a great fan of a lot of the 80s music. And um, I thought I'd had a good run, you know, 67, 86, it's nearly 20 years, you know. Um, I still wanted to work, but I didn't, I was, I didn't like, to, didn't want to do the things I was offered, basically. So I did have some success with a band called King and China Crisis, but, um, yeah, I was about to leave the business. So the fact that I then got in, you know, involved and then spent all that time making these records. Um, and it's ironic, I think, that I, I, I think I will go down when I die. I'll be remembered for Spirit of Eden rather than, you know, the Bob Marley stuff. Or, ah, it's coming nearer. No. <laughs> um, I might be remembered for that more than some of the, you know, because Dido sold 12 million records, you know. Um, Spirit of Eden was a failure at the time. So, but as over the last 30 years, and it's brought me so much work, you know. So it kind of, um, it, it changed my life. <laughs> and um, I looked at making records very differently from, from then on after Spirit of Eden. Um, but it brought me a lot of, of work from all over the world, I mean, Argentina and Norway. And, and when I eventually kind of go, so what made you ring me? You know, thinking it would be Bob Marley or, you know, something that was successful. They all said, oh, Spirit of Eden. So it's kind of weird. So catalytic in that way, you know, the yeah. albums that it's um, influenced, but also the albums that you know, you've worked on as a result of that have far, vastly outsold it. Um, yeah. But, you know, wouldn't exist without it. Yeah, well, I mean, Rollo got me involved because of Spirit of Eden to do originally Faithless, mm. and that led on to Dino. But, I mean, we did Dino's album for 60,000 pounds, and it went on to sell 12 million. You know, laughing stock cost 300, um, Spirit of Eden cost 350,000 and sold about 400,000 copies, so. Let's talk about Tim Priest Green, uh, briefly, producer of, um, of Spirit of Eden. You described Phil uh, quite early on in um, your book, uh, working with Jimmy Miller and Glyn Johns. Um, and you said that Jimmy is uh, one of the best two all-round producers I've ever worked with, the other being Tim Freeze Green. And he was, he was more than just a producer on this record. He a bombshell of a, of a trivia note about this album. I don't want to give away this from the book, but it's too good not to share. Is that the guitar at the beginning of Spirit of Eden is Tim Freeze Green, not Mark Hollis. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, what sort of atmosphere was being generated in the studio by Tim and the band? Because they were definitely sort of, they were one organ, weren't they? Yeah, Tim and Mark on Spirit of Eden were very close. Um, I think it all had all grown out in Color of Spring, basically. Um, but because of the way we worked, um, which was fairly erratic in some ways, so Tim would go and play a guitar, a guitar part, and then Mark would go and play a guitar, you know, the same guitar part. Um, they both shared playing pianos, organs. Um, so who got used, uh, which ones were chosen, um, came down to them when we were playing things back and they go, okay, yeah, let's use this here and that there. And sometimes it was a, an amalgamation of the two. Um, but they were a very tight unit and they had their, Mark's kind of caustic humor in a way got transferred to Tim. So Tim also became, you know, very, sarcastic, I suppose. So if you were in the camp, if you're on their side, it, they never really put me through too much grief. Um, 
but some musicians were given a very hard time. And one of the classic lines that they <coughs> used to have, which when it was first said, it was funny. Um, it was, oh, you really are. Just that. <laughs> and, I mean, I, I think you can all assume what, what that meant, oh, you really are. You know. But it was funny the first few times. When you've been in there for seven months, or you're a musician that has kept getting something wrong, when they turn around and go, oh, you really are, it got more of a, more of an edge to it. And um, it was, yeah, it was kind of unpleasant. I mean, Spirit of Eden still had a great vibe to it. Laughing Stock was a very tough album to make. It was very dark. And the relationship between Tim and Mark, I think, at that point was also changing. But on Spirit of Eden, they were like, they were the team in the corner. They, they knew kind of where the album was supposed to go. I was no privileged to hear the um, uh, recordings made by your <laughs> assistant engineer, Sean Landon. He so said, you heard that you really are. Well, I, they, their, their liberal use of the C word, I, think, I mean, it wasn't even you really are. It was, you know, I'm not going to say that. It, that yeah. Lots and lots of C wording. I mean, it was kind of, and they were all putting on, or well, certainly Mark, and, I th sorry, certainly Tim and I think Lee Harris, the drummer, were putting on kind of Derek and Clive type, sort of either like Derek and Clive voices or very kind of upper class, yes. cut glass accents whilst using the C word. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, it's funny, but I think you said it's hard for you to listen to because there is that under oh, I sort of uh, undertone of, yeah. of threat and, you know, and slight bullying. Now, when Sean sent me that originally, um, and I put it on, it was immediately very negative effect. Because um, if you're in the studio for, you know, a month, in, in, you've got to remember this is all in the dark. There was no lighting at all, apart from an oil projector. And we had... I mean, you've just kind of thrown that one in there, but there might be some people who don't know what, what that... You know, the, the, oh, and oil that, no, the, the, just the fact that it was all done in the dark. Oh, it was all done in the dark, which, which, <laughs> which was basically, it was more Lee that created that. But when we set up on day one for Spirit of Eden, a load of gear turned up, which was basically the gear from this tour. So the roadie unloaded all this stuff, and we had harmoniums and you know, guitars and amps, and, and there were also some lights. Um, Lee had these sound activated lights, and we put Lee in a in a kind of co converted mic cupboard, um, which is where he was going to play the drums. And it wasn't the best, considering you know, Wessex was about the size of this place. And he was in a kind of, you know, five foot by six foot box on one side. So it wasn't the best. But he brought out his um, sound activated lights just to give himself a bit of a vibe. And then he slowly, during the day, as the roadies were setting up, he kept turning lights out. And eventually the, the studio was kind of in darkness, apart from his lights and the, a couple of anger boys. And then he walked into the control room where Tim, Mark and I were kind of discussing, I guess, you know, how we were going to approach things. And he went, wow, it's really bright in here, isn't it? <laughs> Hang on a minute. And he disappeared home and came back about 30 minutes later with a, with a, a 1960s oil projector, which he spent a long time and a lot of noise hammering into the corner of the control room. So it angled down across the desk and the speakers. And he turned it on and then turned out all the lights. And the, S the desk and everything just moved, you know. And he goes, oh, that's much better. <laughs> and again, I thought, you know, it's gonna be, you know, tomorrow we'll be back to normal. And it just stayed like that um, for, you know, seven, eight months. And this is kind of, this probably won't mean much to you, but it was funny at the time. When we came to mix, um, Mark, I think, had this great idea, let's turn the oil projector to go the other way around. <laughs> so, so we fiddled around and we get it to go the other way around. And I think it probably lasted 20 minutes. And everyone went, this is doing my head in. You've got to put it back to normal. <laughs> and put it back to, to the way it was. But, um, well, we're very lucky to have one such old projector with us this evening and we will be listening to the album in darkness with the very same vibe. Watching Phil <laughs> gently go inside. <laughs>